Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Misty Michael from x Right Photo, and I'd like to welcome you to our latest guest presenter webinar, Color Stylization, using Photoshop adjustments to create individual image styles with professional photographer Mark Wood. Before Mark gets underway, let me just give you a very quick introduction. Mark is both an x Right Colorati and a fine art and commercial photographer, and he's won several awards for his fine art. He originally trained as a printmaker, moving to digital print in the mid-90s. Mark teaches workshops on photography and digital imaging, Adobe Creative Suites, and is an Apple certified trainer. Mark also offers private training to groups or individuals. So please visit his website, markwoodphotography.com, to learn more. So during the webinar, please be aware that people who listen through speakers sometimes have trouble hearing the presenter. So we recommend you listen through your headphones. But if that isn't possible and you're having sound issues, don't worry, because I'm recording the webinar and it will be available on Vimeo within the next few days. If you have any questions, please write them in the appropriate question panel and we'll try and respond live. But if we're not able to, we'll answer as many as we can at the end of the webinar. Any unanswered questions will be collated after the webinar and we'll respond to those as best we can. Now let's begin the webinar and hand over to Mark. Hello everyone, it's uh, good to be here. I'm going to uh, take you through some stuff in Photoshop, but uh, I'm going to start off in Aperture just really to explain what I mean by color stylization. There are two kinds of enhancement we could make to a photograph, and one would be corrective enhancement, and that's the sort of thing we get concerned about in color management, accurately rendering the scenes in a uh, the colors in a scene and getting them matched all the way through to print. Well, what I'm going to talk about is creative enhancement. What I've got here is a, a book that I made a few years ago now where some of the photographs have been enhanced so they represent correct color and others have had heavy stylization applied. Perhaps a good example is this uh, street scene uh, from uh, San Francisco. So I'm just going to bury in here. This is the uh, stylized image, and this is the original without the color applied. So in this webinar, I'm going to be showing you several techniques for creating color effects so that we can perhaps move beyond some of the uh, very popular filters we find on smartphones. So I'm going to go over to uh, Adobe Bridge now and find a photograph of Prague. Now, let me explain as I open this up into uh, Photoshop. I'd been at a, uh, a conference and I didn't notice there was dust in my camera, so I, I expose this to you now as a bit of a problem. So I'm just going to quickly heal this image. Okay, and I think there's one more just here. That will do. Now, before I click Open Object, I'm just going to explain how I work in a camera raw because I'd like to work non-destructively. So in this hyperlink here, what I've done is switched on the option at the bottom which opens this raw file as a smart object in Photoshop. I think it's a really useful thing to do. You'll also note that I use the Profoto workspace and I'm working in 16 bits per channel. Anyway, I'm going to click OK and open this object up into Photoshop and start the enhancement. So I've cleaned up the dust. The file is open now as a smart object. And I'm going to jump in here to create a color effect. So let me just come down here. And I'm going to start off with the photo filter. And on here I get a, a kind of warm filter, the sort of thing that uh, it approximates the sort of thing you could get on a, a lens of a camera, you, a filter you could apply. So I'm going to add that. And in this webinar, I'm not just going to leave these filters in their normal mode. The key to success is to change the blending modes. And in this case, I would suggest uh, overlay. You see how that's dramatically changed the effect. So if I go back to normal, it's OK, but slightly odd. Moving to uh, lighten, screen. Screen looks rather good. 
There are several modes to, that I would look at first. Screen, overlay, soft light, and perhaps multiply being my favorite. But I'm just going to come back to uh, the overlay option. And at the moment, this is uh, just looking ever so slightly dark at the bottom. So what I could do is just get my uh, gradient here, my gradient tool, and click and drag upwards. And I create a gradient fill to look on the image. So removing the effect at the bottom of the screen. I'm now going to use color balance to tone up the image a little bit more. And in this image as well, this, the uh, buildings have become rather dark, so perhaps I would finish off by uh, using curves. So I can lighten up the building area and dragging down the highlights a little bit. So I've made this sort of pastoral, rather romantic looking uh, uh, riverscape, but I haven't quite finished yet. What I'm going to do now is this is a smart object. So I'm going to go to filter and go to blur and apply a Gaussian blur to the entire image. And I'm really cranking this up. There are different blur options, but I'm just going to stick with Gaussian for this uh, webinar. I'm going to click OK. And I get another mask. So the key to my working is using adjustment layers and masks and blending modes. So going over to the smart filter mask here, and I can pick up my paintbrush. And I'm going to change the opacity of the brush to 100%. Just to show you as well, I'm using a soft brush. And I'm going to make it a bit bigger. So bringing through the buildings absolutely sharply and changing the opacity maybe to say 30%. I've created a soft and I think attractive romantic view of Prague. Take a look at the uh, layers panel here and you'll see as I'm working this is a, a sort of common practice for me. But I'm going to do something slightly different so I think I'll leave that one there and jump over back to a bridge and a photograph of Ray the guitar player. I've already uh, stretched this image uh, so I've added a bit of extra canvas to make the composition better so the raw file is, uh, looks like that, I've added an extra canvas and I'm going to open this up again in Photoshop. I do have Photoshop CC on the machine but um, I just thought I'd stick with Photoshop CS6 because I think perhaps more people might be using that. And this time, I have the image of Ray, and I can apply a black and white filter. But wait a moment, this, this black and white filter isn't making the image black and white because its blending mode is in soft light. So let's uh, start at the bottom here. Going down to the new Create New Fill or Adjustment Layer icon, I'm going to pick up black and white. I quite like this, it's a rather easy to use filter. I've uh, pressed this little button here and I can use the eyedropper, the pipette, to click on tones and colours in the image and lighten them or darken them. So it's a quite an effective way to make a black and white image. But by changing the blending mode to soft light, I get a rather different effect. Again, let's take a look at overlay. Similar, perhaps a little too harsh, and lighten. It looks very washed out. It's not going to work for me on this occasion. So back to soft light. And Ray's jacket has become rather dark. So at this point, I'd come through here and choose curves. And lift up the tone in the jacket. and bring back the tones in the highlights. I'm careful not to make the, the uh, curve too bendy. It uh, will destroy the tone in the photograph. And that's looking OK. And the last thing I'm going to do is apply a little bit of colour balance. So onto colour balance here, I'm going to warm up the image by adding orange, so red and yellow together. 
but this time I'm going to change the blending mode to screen. And if I'm going rather quick for some people, do remember this will be posted on Vimeo. If you're watching this on Vimeo, you'll be aware that it's been posted on Vimeo. So I'm just going to bring back the opacity of this layer. So there's a, a subtle screen effect, kind of lifting the image and putting a bit of zing into a raised face. So that's another quick way to stylize an image. The advantage of the route I've just taken with this is because I've not painted anything in on the masks, this could be turned into a Photoshop action. Coming back to the image of Prague, Pretty much everything could have been a, uh, built into a Photoshop action except for the painting out of the blur in the selected area. So if I was going to record this as a Photoshop action, I wouldn't have painted back the blur uh, to sharpen up the uh, buildings again. So that's two approaches. Now I'm going to take things uh, to an extreme level. I'm going to close these files down. I won't bother saving that. Back to bridge. I'm going to work with this. I'm going to do something rather dramatic. Something that I should mention is that I work in graphics. I work in a lot of different areas. And sometimes I use photographs as illustrations for a book or for a, a leaflet. So I'm not actually looking for a photographic effect. I'm looking for, more for a posterized effect. And that's exactly what I'm going to do with this Ferris wheel. So I'm going to click on here and make sure I open this with uh, Photoshop. Again, it's going to be opening this Pro Photo 16 bits as an object. What I want to do is access a gradient map. So here we go. This is another filter to I think is really useful. I'm going to click on here. And I have a very dramatic posterized effect, but it's not the one I want. So I can click on this little drop down menu from properties and change this. But what I'm going to do, perhaps from this black and white preset, is um, come down here. He says, come on, there we go. Clicking on the thing until I get the whole gradient eight, uh, editor open. And what I'm going to do is double click on this tab. So double clicking here, I get my color picker. I click, and uh, it's sort of a, a cherryish sort of magentary red, so I'm not happy with that. I'm just going to move this around a little, perhaps shifting the color slider up until I get a, an orange that I like. And I'll click OK. And at the other end, I don't want white, so I'm going to click on here and move this up until I get into some sort of yellows. I'm getting an on-screen preview straight away. Happy with that. And then I can click on this midpoint slider to control the tone balance. If I'm not uh, careful, I can click too many times and get an extra tab. No problem. Sometimes I want that, but in this occasion I don't. All you do is you click on it and I'm dragging it away and it restores the pattern. So I'm pretty happy with that. I'll click OK. And so we have this poster effect, the kind of thing that you might create in printmaking, something that I did a lot of um, in my youth. But to finish this off, I want to add a little bit of punch to the image. So I'm going to take the Ferris wheel layer, copy this up, and just for ease, I'm going to right click on this and rasterize this layer so it will no longer be a smart object, it will just be pixels. And uh, choose multiply. See the multiply mode punches through to the layer beneath. Maybe that's a little too dark. Or maybe I want to manipulate this pixel layer a little more so maybe just come down here and choose levels and I'm going to clip this levels adjustment to the pixel layer beneath so to do that I'm holding down the alt or option key and now this levels will only affect this pixel layer and I can adjust the tone 
of the pixel layer here. Anyway, that's a, a posterized effect, and you can see this making a, you know, put some type on this and some lettering, and you can welcome to the fair, or it could be a book jacket design. So, and I, I like that because it expands the range of uh, photographic services I can offer. But as you push around color like this, you can create some color management problems. This image is rather muted, but I might be working with images and saturating up colors beyond the level with which they could be printed. So I'm going to show you a little keynote presentation now, which covers off some issues on color management. So, uh, so we just come in to just check if I've selected the right slide. I have. So, a little bit on the theory of color management. You might be aware that not all printers and all print processes are equal. So you might have a bright red color in Photoshop and you want to print it. Printer A is great. Printer B's made the image, the color look a little bit dull. And printer C is pretty weak. But it also could be that this is a great printer and that A, B and C represent different paper types you're sticking into the printer. I'm speaking about inkjet printing or it could be um, an acrylic print at a photo lab or a metal print, surface print, aluminium print. You might specify or, or see on your screen a lovely bright red, but in print it just doesn't work out well. That isn't necessarily that you've done your color management wrong. It's just that the printing device and the paper or material you're using to print on can't support that bright red. So um, print, my Epson printer could print A beautifully on gloss papers. It might look a bit like B on photo rag papers. And maybe on some cheap, uh, cheap, cheap stock, it would look like C. So something to bear in mind. And a way we can check for color changes, it's been something been in Photoshop for many years called gamut warning. Now, this is Ray again. Um, the image on the left is an RGB image. The image on the right is a simulation of CMYK. And an old school way of checking the color difference, and you might notice a color difference on your monitors, you might, would be revealed if you switched on gamut warning in Photoshop. The gray areas represent colors that cannot be printed in the CMYK version. Now that is a little old school, and what we use today is this process called soft proofing, and that's something I'll be looking at a little later on. But why is this the case? Red, green, blue, light make white. You can't mix red, green, and blue ink to make white. It's going to end up being black. So as you're probably well aware, cyan, magenta, yellow, in pure theory, makes a black. In reality, you can't mix ink that strongly to create a black. So black is always either a dirty brown or a gray color. And we use a key plate, the black plate, to key in that black in lithographic printing and things like that. So cyan magenta, yellow, black, mixing together, cyan, cyan, magenta. And these tend to do a lot of work, both in inkjet printers and in litho printing in magazines. You, to that you add yellow, and you can see that the shadows are hollow because it's the black plate that keys in the detail. And this is part of the color management dilemma we face. The big colored arch, the chromaticity arch, represents all the colors the standard human eye can see. The white triangle represents standard generic RGB, and the black shape represents standard cyan magenta yellow black in magazine print. Now lots of inkjet manufacturers have extended the gamut of their printers so that that black shape is bigger by adding light magentas, orange inks, vibrant inks to the mix so that you can extend the standard print colors to match those of, um, of RGB. But there can still be some color management issues here. In an ideal world, and these C, M, and P represent camera, monitor, printer, 
in an ideal world, all the colors the camera can capture would be able to be displayed on a computer monitor and that the gamut of the printing device was larger than that of the camera. So what you saw on your screen would always encompass the colors of print, but unfortunately that's not the case. Cameras can capture more tone that can be displayed on even the best of monitors. And print spaces are often a lot, well, they vary. They vary in shape. I'll show you that in a moment. So in trying to render the poster effect of the Ferris wheel, you might need to choose between different rendering intents. This is perceptual, where all the colors scale. Fantastic for portraiture, but not necessarily for some of the poster effects I'm showing. We can change uh, rendering intents on the fly in Photoshop. In this case, uh, I, I'm showing relative color metric because any colors within gamut, say a, that red of the Ferris wheel, will not change if it's been compromised in the print process. There are four rendering intents and they are perceptual, which is good for photographers, saturation, which is best left for business graphics because it's not good for photography at all. Relative colour metric, which is good for both photographers and designers because it retains quite a few signature colours. An absolute colour metric, which does retain signature colours and is great for proofing, hard proofing that is, but not suitable for general photography because it requires quite a lot of good colour management practice to make it work properly. So all of these can be changed on the fly and I would tend to choose between perceptual or relative colour metric to see which uh, rendering intent would work best for me. We also just need to take a quick look at some colour spaces. The coloured shape, the coloured arch at the back is a chromaticity arch. It represents all the colours the standard human eye can see. And of the colour spaces on screen, the large red triangle represents Prophoto RGB, which is actually greater than human perception, but a very useful colour space, but does require good colour management. The white triangle re represents Adobe RGB 1998 and Pantone colours, the sort of things that graphic designers might choose, can exist in that space, but not in the necessarily in the triangle that's red dotted lines and that's sRGB. Now sRGB is a good colour space, it is small, it represents the synthetic colour space of high definition television and photo lab machines. So it is a good space and is well worth thinking about. But we do tend to use Prophoto. The black shape represents standard CMYK for repro printing. And one last little bit of theory before I move to an Apple utility. I would suggest assigning profiles to images because assigning images, assigning profiles is non-destructive whereas converting an image is, uh, to a profile is destructive editing. I'm just going to leave this on screen for a moment so that uh, on video playback people can take a little read. And I'm going to jump back out of this into Apple Color Sync. You can get similar utilities on PC. So here we have sRGB as a color space represented in three dimensions. I'm going to right click on this and hold for comparison and compare it with Adobe RGB 1998. In fact, what I ought to do is hold for comparison and do it the other way around. There we go. But the ghosted out shape is Adobe RGB 1998 and the colored shape is sRGB. This is the generic factory uh, setting for my monitor that I'm using at the moment. So I'll hold for comparison and choose sRGB and you can see a good match. There are better monitors now that would display a greater gamut close to that of our Adobe RGB 1998. But here's the um, interesting challenge we face. I'll come back to sRGB and hold for comparison and choose a paper stock. So I have an Epson 3800 and perhaps I would like to print on photo rag here. The shapes really don't match at all. So in compromising the color, in changing it from screen to print, I have to choose the right rendering intent, whether that's perceptual or relative.
something to bear in mind. Anyway, I'm going to finish that bit of theory and jump back into some more stylization. And here we have a poster image, or what will become a poster image. I was doing some work in London, wandering around at night, and uh, saw this, took a photograph, and the photograph itself is okay, but it's, it lacks something. I want to stylize it, so I'm going to do that now. And here's one I've prepared earlier, so I'm just going to click on this little button here. Clicking on here. Come on. Taking a moment, there we go. So what we're aiming for is a posterized look in the image. Let me just get a little bit closer. And I can switch that off and switch that on. So I'll show you how I go about this. I'll uh, switch off this layer. In fact, I'll stick it in the, the trash here so you're not getting uh, confused. The Photoshop filters menu uh, is a place you could spend hours fishing around trying to find things. I'm just going to show you uh, my favorite option. I should mention that for the filter gallery not to be grayed out, the image mode needs to be 8 bits per channel. So uh, I would be bringing in the images into this version of Photoshop in 16 bits per channel from RAW. I'd have to convert to 8 bits per channel in order to get the filter gallery to gray out, uh, to not be grayed out. So I'll choose this option. That's huge. So I'm just going to reduce this in size. And my favorite filter is cutout. There are so many. And people might like poster edges and uh, or say paint daubs. But for the poster effect, I think cutout works really well. Showing you some of the options here, we have a number of levels. Number of levels means number of tones or colors in the image. So if I reduce this, the image renders with less color. Now, Sometimes having less color works better. It adds to the, the poster effect. So don't think that setting it at 8 is the right thing to do all the time. I'll leave it on 8 today, but it's not always the right thing to do. Edge simplicity is currently set at 2, but if I turn this up, the edges become more simplified. And they get a, a sort of spiky look. I thought that uh, where I was around two or three works best. And then edge fidelity, because this is like a tracing around the edges of tone and color, would be the next option. So here um, it's set to two. If I turn this down, the image changes, bring it back up, edge fidelity higher. It sharpens up the edges, but maybe reveals too much of the sort of uh, messy lines here. So you can just choose an option to suit. You're getting feedback on screen. I'm happy with that and I'll click OK. Because this is a smart object, I can access the filter gallery at any time and make changes to those settings. But then what I would be doing is using hue and saturation. But let me work from the top. Rather than activate this layer, I'm going to take uh, this and stick it in the trash. So down here, choose uh, hue and saturation. Clicking this button here, I can click on the background and change the hue. Change the saturation. And the reason for showing you that keynote on uh, color management and color spaces is that I'm really forcing in a very bright red here. This red may not be printable, so it's important to assess that in um, using soft proofing. I can also change the lightness of the color. Something else that I can do is I've targeted reds. Can you see this little section here? I'm targeting the central reds. By moving the outer sliders, I'm starting to bring the yellows and light greens into the color effect that I'm using. And likewise, magenta. This central area 
changes things too. Can you see a subtle change? So using these sliders, I can target the range of reds that will be changed in the hue saturation that I've, I've applied here. But I'm happy with that. <clears throat> and next, I'm going to move on to something that's uh, rather good fun. That's the color lookup. I'm going to go down here just to show you where you find it. It's here, the color lookup adjustments. And there are a number of filters. I think I'm going to go for um, film stock. So there we go. See what this looks like. But you can play through the different options. And actually, these are worth looking at on a photograph that hasn't been posterized. In fact, I quite like the fall colors. I'm going to leave it on that. And maybe as a finishing touch, I could try and manipulate hue and saturation again, but that's not necessary. I'm going to come back to hue and saturation and do this again at the top. And I can affect the overall hue of the image without targeting the red areas or target reds again and make an adjustment after choosing color lookup. And that's another way of creating a poster book jacket look in an image. Let's move back to something that's more recognizably photographic. And I have this railway crossing image here. So I'm going to open this into Photoshop. And in the great tradition of cooking programs, just in case things go wrong, yet again, I've made some stuff earlier. And what I'm going to be doing is creating this look. You can see how each of these layers is changing the color, look, and feel of this image. So it looks cinematic, or it looks uh, like a retro image from the 50s or 60s. 70s, it's up to you. This is a way of making these things for yourself. So um, I also point out that I've got some NIC options here. So let me just switch these off. Come down here. This is a, a color effects option. I found another company that's doing some very interesting uh, film effects, and I'll show you those at the end of the webinar. So I'll switch that off and hide this and show you how I go about this process. So let me switch that off. Firstly, back down to the Create New Fill or Adjustment Layer icon, and I'm going to pick up Hue Saturation. Again, I'm going to target an area in the image, this time the blue of the sky. So although I'm creating very different look and feel in different photographs, I'm actually returning to the same adjustment layers over and over again. So I'm going to use the eyedropper, the pipette, to click on the sky to target the blues, then change the hue of the blues. And I kind of like this uh, tealy blue color. And I can affect its saturation and its lightness. But something, maybe you can see this if I just push it around a lot. Can you see the sky is banding? There are there's a darker tone, lighter tone, darker tone, lighter tone. As you start to manipulate the tones in a big way, you can start to bring in posterization. So it's very important to work with a good monitor. So I'll go come back in and uh, target those blues again. Being careful not to posterize the sky. Next up, let's just close down the neck. I might start playing around with curves. But actually, what I think I'm going to do is, just like Ray the guitar player sat down in, in the studio, I'm going to choose black and white. Targeting the black and white again, I can lighten the sky, darken the sky. Can you see that? Oh, that's, that's better. Can you see that posterization appearing now? I mean, that's far too extreme, but it's something you've got to be careful of. But the great thing about working with adjustment layers is that if 
the posterization starts to occur, you can go back to any one of the layers and start and uh, change it so that uh, everything moves as a smooth gradient. So let's just uh, come back here, click on here. And then I'm going to change the blending mode of this to soft light whilst I'm at it we can take a look at overlay and lighten but I think soft light or overlay let's just have a look a look I think a soft light is doing a better job but I am starting to lose the um, the color and tone in these areas I could get my paintbrush to make this brush a bit smaller. <clears throat> I'll change the opacity up to 100%, and I could paint in here to bring those areas back. That's great if this is the only image I'm going to be working on, but if I'm going to write a Photoshop action to do some batching, I probably don't want to be painting on a mask. So I'm going to see what I can achieve by using curves to lift the shadow area. And in this, I'm going to do something, well, I, I could try lifting the tones like this, dragging them down. Okay, if you do it too much, the image flattens out and loses all, it, all its life. So I'm not uh, going to be careful. But you can also lift this end point up. Let me just reset this. Lift this end point up. And you can see this is becoming a, a gray area. So I can lift up, then move the slider in as a, a better way to finesse these very dark shadows that I'm getting. And from there, I could use color balance. to further change the image and I could quite happily leave that on normal mode but in trying to explore process I can take a look at different blending modes screen pleasantly washed out when you lower its opacity or overlay or soft light but I think I'm pretty happy with normal. So I'm just checking the other things that I've done here. So I can also dismiss color balance and add a completely blank pixel layer. <clears throat> and with this, I'm going to choose a color. Hmm. I, again, I've obviously been here on this image earlier. So I'm choosing a sort of golden yellow color. I'm going to click OK. And go, go to the edit menu and fill. And I'm going to fill that blank layer with the foreground color. I need to make sure that preserved transparency is switched off because if it was on, nothing would happen. So that's unchecked. And this has become uh, bright yellow. And then I can change the blending mode. Darken. Multiply. Lighten, screen, overlay, soft light. And I'm pretty happy with that soft light look. It's given me a, a really powerful look to the image. Now this curves here, I could try to manipulate this curve to give me more tonal control. But there is no harm because this is non-destructive working at the moment, none at all, in coming back to curves or even levels and dragging around the image further. Though I will point out that these spikes you're seeing in this histogram represent highly manipulated tones. They're, they could cause some problems, but I envisage that this image would be printed on a photo rag paper or something like that. So it's quite forgiving. So I can lighten, darken tones, adjust in, and I'm done. 
I say I'm done. This is on screen, but what will this look like in print? To assess that, I'm going to use soft proofing. So uh, let me go to view, proof setup. You can see that I have a few options here, but I'm going to start from scratch. So this is something that I recommend you do if you're working with fine art papers on an inkjet printer or set up soft proofing for the photo lab that you're using and any particular uh, non-standard print processes. So here we go, custom. And then under device to simulate, open this up and you will access all of the print profiles that you've installed on your machine. So MW, my initials, represent profiles I've made for these different kinds of paper stocks. These are factory-based um, profiles that I've downloaded. This is from Hannah Miller Fine Art. You could also get similar profiles from your photo lab for the processes that you're interested in using there. In fact, I'm gonna use the canned profile, I think, for um, Hannah Muller Bamboo. And I can simulate the paper color. The bamboo paper is uh, is a rather pleasing. It's not yellow and it's not cream, but it's a. It looks a bit like bamboo, but very washed out. Lovely stuff. But by choosing simulate paper color, I'm getting an accurate representation on screen of the colors in print. Having said that, in working with something like bamboo, it would be a good idea to make a hard proof just to check that everything was perfect. So calibrated monitor, a good monitor, calibrated, profiled with uh, soft proofing, you'll use less ink and paper trying to get a result, but um, you do need to make a hard proof just to make sure that uh, you're happy with the overall look and feel of the print. If this is good, and I'm gonna be using this process often, notice the rendering intent is cut relative. I could change this on the fly to perceptual relative. Can you see the shadows changing? So, so much for theory. You can see it on the fly here. Uh, and I can save this as uh, X-Rite webinar. I would normally call it, bam well, call it bamboo. And this will be saved in the correct directory on my system. So that I can call on that when I need to. So that's view proof is on and off. That's command Y on the Mac. So this is the um, soft proofing on, soft proofing off. And the great thing about having soft proofing on for fine art printing is that I could, again, perhaps return to the curves I've been using and adjust those to soft proofing on. So I'm changing the tone with the bamboo view on screen. Hopefully I'm not going too fast. I've only got a little bit more to show you. So I'm going to come back to um, the bridge here and pick up another image. This time I'm going to open with Photoshop. I'd uh, arrived in Williams in Arizona late at night with my family and I just had to walk up and down Route 66 for a little while and it was really dark. So let me show you what the original image looked like. And being a printmaker, so someone that's worked with etching, silkscreen, uh, stone lithography, uh, the fine art processes, I could see in my mind what I'd like from this image. So. I've used gradient map to posterize the image rather than using an, a filter for posterizing. Then I've applied curves and then some hue and saturation. And at this point, I noticed that the lamp posts were slightly curved and the building was slightly warped because I'd, uh, the, the lens I was using. So I took these layers and merge them to create this layer, which I then corrected. I the top of the lamp 
just painted that out. And when I did that, I went back to hue saturation to change the tone. However, that might be not necessary because say if I wanted to print this onto uh, bamboo paper, I could go to view, proof setup, and webinar bamboo. That's on, proof colors. So command Y on and off. So that's with soft proofing off, and that's with my hue and saturation to get the saturation intent I was looking for. But in print, it's already slightly desaturating on the bamboo. So maybe if I'm going to use this again, this that's far too gray now. I could open this panel up and uh, take a look at the blues, which I've changed, and maybe not have the saturation turned down as much. And now when I print that image, it will be pretty much what I'm seeing on my display. So as a bit of revision, I'm going to take it from the top and walk through this stylization. So the first step would be gradient map. They're not the colors I'm looking for, so I'm going to open up the swatch here, the gradient editor. By double clicking on this, I can change the color. What I want to be careful of is choosing a nice color that's close to what I want, but I can always use hue and saturation to change it later, so I'll click OK at that. And at the other end, I need yellow. Yellows are always a tricky color in print. They can look rather sickly. And actually on a color management point, uh, something that I know from my graphics, this is an out of gamut color. So the yellow I'm choosing here is not reproducible in standard CMYK, the sort of thing you'd find in Reaper graphics. So by clicking on that tab, I jump to the nearest yellow that will print. But anyway, I'll click OK. And then I can move this slider around to adjust the image. And I can actually say, you know, that's OK. I'm going to leave that. I could use curves to affect the tones in the image. Then from there, go to hue and saturation and target these colors. Um, and then making sure I target these yellows. And that's pretty much how I approach that image. So let's just take a little look through in Bridge and a little recap before I show you some other options. I started off with the image of Prague, where I used, um, let's come out and open this up in Photoshop. It's a smart object. I used the photo filter, let's double click on this, the warming filter to add a bit of an orange effect, color balance and curves. I then jumped onto the image of Ray I'll just see if he's still open here. Um, no, nope, need to open him up again, so just come down here. Right click, come on, open with Photoshop. And on this image, I used black and white, but in the soft light mode, then curves and color balance. The color balance being used in screen mode. before moving on to something quite radical, and I think that's still open here. Uh, just used it a moment ago. It's the joy of having so many objects open in Photoshop. Window, Ferris wheel, 
can't see the tab. And in this case, I was using gradient map, and gradient map you've seen I've used a lot. And from there, I just uh, copied up the layer and applied levels to it, and this layer is in the multiply mode. But if all of that seems like too much, you know, that it's um, far too much photoshopping, one, bear in mind that once you've got these off and you've created your own, you can turn them into a Photoshop action. But if it is something that you're not keen on, uh, I used to really like using Nick plugins, but I found an alternative, um, some from DxO in the film pack. So earlier on today, I just installed the film pack as a demo onto this machine. So let me find this photograph here, and I'm going to open this into Photoshop. And from my filter list, I'll go into Film Pack. Like I say, it's a demo version, so um, I might have to uh, just click Continue. There we go, yes, I'll try that. It's all loading up nicely. So in here, I could choose different presets. I'll choose this old postcard one. So you're applying a lot of effects straight away. And the nice thing about this approach um, is that you don't start with the blank canvas that you would have in Photoshop. You can choose a preset and then opening up this panel on the right, you can go through the different options and change them to suit your taste. When I click Save on that file, and it comes into Photoshop, let's click OK. Um, I can, I'm free to play with the image in here. So much as I like to work in Photoshop and create my own look and feel, it's really great to be able to access third-party filters. But you know, I think I'm done. I've, I've toured through a lot of stuff. Uh, hopefully I've not gone too quickly for you. You'll be able to review on video, slow things down. But uh, yeah, this is a webinar brought to you by the layers panel adjustment layers, blending modes, and using the masks. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Mark. Uh, we don't have any questions at this time, but okay. if anybody does have any questions later, you're welcome to email us at webinars at colorconfidence.com, and I will hassle Mark until he has an answer for you. Okay. No problem. All right. Thanks for watching, everybody. If there are more questions, I'll collate them and answer it as soon as I can. Uh, don't forget, you can learn more about Mark and what he does at markwoodphotography.com. And our webinar archive is going to be available at xrightphoto.com forward slash learning. So I will upload this as soon as I can so you can watch it again. And once again, thank you, Mark. And thanks to everyone who watched. Thank you very much.